Good day to you from uh, all points across the globe. 982 registered at last count. I'd like to say thank you for joining us for this discussion put together by the good people at Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. Medicines for the people. What will the next decade look like? And let's be clear, the visualization we'll be discussing today is one that begs to see a radical change in culture around the world when it comes to reaching the most vulnerable, understanding their needs, delivering on the commitments we made as we set out on this journey. I'm Patricia Amira. And I'm so looking forward to your active participation in the next hour and beyond, as this is just the start of a conversation and action to deliver on a far reaching vision for global health. You can submit questions through the session, throughout the session via the Q&A function on Zoom, kindly stating to whom it needs to be addressed. We hope to have at least 10 minutes for this at the end of the panel discussion. There is simultaneous interpretation in Spanish and French. Click on interpretation at the bottom of your screen, just checking to see that I have it there, um, to activate this service. Um, I noticed many retweets um, on Twitter about the event, but not much in the way of actual statements. So I encourage you to also share your vision for global health on social media. What would you like to see? Is it equitable access for your main focus? What aspects of One Health spur you on in your work every day? Just share your vision. Okay, let's now welcome Marie-Paul Kienia, who holds a number of active positions in the field of health, including being the Director of Research at INSERM, which is a French initiative set up in 2019 as part of the Investment Programme for the Future where she is in charge of the Priority Research Programme on Antibiotic Resistance. Marie-Paul is also the board chair of DNDI and hopes for more gender responsive R&D in her vision of the future. A very warm welcome to you, Marie-Paul. Thank you very much and, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to, to all. It is a pleasure to be with you and to have the opportunity to start this webinar uh, on uh, new medicines. So um, let me just uh, make a few words of introduction. So the, the global response to COVID-19 has led to the development of vaccines, treatments and diagnostics at unprecedented speed. But it has also revealed the ugly truth about the inequalities of our global medical innovation system. It is therefore timely that DNDI has just launched his new strategic plan to continue to address unequal access to innovation. To develop a plan, we consulted widely with partners and stakeholders to unpack the challenges for therapeutic innovation and access that, still today, leaves millions without proper treatment. We assessed how, in the next decade, infectious diseases are likely to affect the most vulnerable people and the least resource settings most acutely. These include neglected tropical diseases and viral infections, including pandemic prone and climate sensitive diseases. This is DNDI's focus to protect the most vulnerable through equitable access to the best medicines. The COVID-19 pandemic started soon after we launched these explorations and has brought higher attention to the global health innovation agenda. I'm very proud that DNDI was able to be nimble and leverage its R&D expertise to engage with low and middle income country scientists, in particular, to foster the creation of a coalition. The anti cov clinical trial platform, a child of this coalition, is actively researching medical intervention for non-hospitalized COVID-19 patients in low income settings. And it is our hope that we will identify safe, effective and affordable medicines to help countries fight the health and social burden put on them by COVID-19. Indeed, while all global attention is now focused on development and purchase of COVID-19 vaccine, we should not forget about treatment and diagnostics. With our partners, FIND and UNITAID and others, DNDI is advocating for more investment into this area. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I believe that all together we have a unique opportunity to bring to the limelight again the chronic and persistent 
fatal imbalance between health needs, investment and access to medical intervention. While many rich countries themselves are struggling for access to what they see as life and economy saving vaccines, voices from all parts of the world are calling for more equity and solidarity. This is a time for global change. We are making history. Let us not waste this chance. Thank you very much. It is against that backdrop that we host this debate, and I'm glad to welcome our distinguished panelist on behalf of DNDA and our moderator, uh, Patricia Amira. But before we start, we have asked some remarkable young people from around the world for their vision of global health in the ne next decade. Let's hear from Alistair from Zimbabwe, from Christine from Guyana, from Joyce from Kenya. And this is what they've told us. Video, please. Hi, my name is Alistair Mkundiwa. I'm a medical doctor and a health equity advocate from Zimbabwe. And this is my vision for the next 10 years in global health. I envision a world where neglected tropical diseases and neglect in healthcare in general are a thing of the past, where we have learned that healthcare for all can only be achieved by the meaningful participation of women, the youth, people of color, people with disabilities, and all chronically underrepresented parts of the population. Hello, my name is Christine Somwaru, and I'm a climate and gender justice advocate living in Guyana. Throughout the pandemic, and more so with the recent development of the vaccine, I have seen firsthand the disproportionate distribution of the vaccine um, for developed and developing countries. Within my own country, Guyana, and in the Caribbean, we have only received small dosage of the vaccine. In building back better in the next 10 years, my vision for global health is one that takes the environment into consideration equitably support groups such as Black, Indigenous, people of color, and women. In 10 years, I hope that traditional knowledge would be globally recognized and highlighted as a key resource in addressing global health. My name is Joyce Amundioma. I am a HIV youth advocate from Kenya, and my vision in the next 10 years for global health is global health security. As a HIV advocate, I dream of an ideal world where there will be zero new HIV infections as there will be a HIV vaccine. A world where there will be zero uh, HIV and AIDS related mortality as we will be having a HIV cure. Simply, in the next 10 years, I would love to see the current global health momentum towards COVID-19 being passed forward to all the other existing epidemics that pose as threats to global health security such as HIV. Thank you. Wow, fantastic. Healthcare for all. Meaningful participation by all. Traditional knowledge as a resource and seeing the same collaborative momentum for other diseases as has been seen with COVID. Youth vision and vigor. Alison, Christine and Joyce, they're sharing their thoughts for the next 10 years. Now, a lot has changed for healthcare in general in the past year. So what else can we expect? We have quite the expert panel of leaders with us to help unpack some of the challenges in and around R&D, plus share a glimpse of future healthcare in which no one is left behind. Dr. Bernard Picoule, Executive Director of DNDI. Dr. Bernard Ogutu, Chief Research Officer of the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Um, we also have Dr. Jeremy Farah, Director of Welcome, uh, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, the Chief Scientist of the World Health Organization. Thank you for being part of this important discussion. And before we dive in, I'd like to ask you to keep your responses uh, as sharp yet informative as possible so that we can have some time at the end of uh, the discussion for four or five questions from the audience, okay? Uh, okay. <coughs> Let's begin with you, shall we? Uh, and the new eight-year vision DNDI has recently launched. Um, DNDI, let's say, was created to fill a huge gap for needs-driven R&D back in 2003. What has changed since? And of course, in the context of the ongoing pandemic, new strategies going forward are vital in ensuring that DNDI remains relevant as it looks to the future, right? Thanks, Patricia. Uh, good, good morning or uh, good afternoon to all of you. 
before I talk about the strategy for the next decade, the next eight years, let me start from the example of sleeping sickness, a killing disease affecting population in Central Africa and Western Africa. When I was a doctor with MSF, the only treatment available was an arsenic derivate, so toxic that it killed one in 20 patients. This was not acceptable. That frustration is where the NDI was born. From the experience of humanitarian doctors frustrated when treating patients with medicines that were ineffective, unsafe, unavailable, unaffordable, or that have never been developed at all because the R&D was, research and development was abandoned. We launched the NDI as an alternative way to discover and develop drugs. And since 2003, we have delivered eight treatments for five different diseases. We have concentrated our effort on neglected tropical diseases, where R&D has been abandoned for years or decades because of being outside of the commercial market. But we also uh, dedicated some effort to uh, neglected people, population, well illustrated by children living with HIV, as well as diseases for which a treatment option exists, but they are out of reach because they are too expensive. And here, uh, hepatitis C is a perfect illustration. We are not the solution to the problem, but we are part of a solution. And we have shown uh, uh, the alternative model can deliver. To come back to sleeping sickness, we have recently developed fexinidazole, a new chemical entity, the first oral treatment that can be taken at home, a real paradigm chief for patients. And we, have, we are now developing uh, another drug, a single dose oral treatment to support elimination of the disease. So today we are looking to the future and we are proposing a bold agenda for the next eight years, 2021, 2028. Our first objective and central objective is to deliver uh, 15 to 18 uh, additional treatment to the eight that we have already developed with two periods. The next period of 2021, 20, 20, 20, uh, we expect to develop 10 to 12 treatment based on the fact that today in our portfolio, we have a large number of projects at a mature stage, so either at the stage of registration or at the stage of phase three, so the last stage of, of development. And during the second period, we plan to develop an, another five to seven new treatment based on current new chemical entities that we have included uh, in our portfolio thanks to the effort of discovery, but also uh, thanks to extension, expansion of our portfolio to new areas of need, including uh, diseases linked to climate change, like dengue, or pandemic-prone diseases like COVID today. Because for COVID, uh, DNDI is already very active through uh, R&D with drug discovery efforts, through uh, uh, Anticov, a clinical trial platform addressing the needs of mid patients in certain African countries, but also through a partnership with COVID Clinical Research Coalition, galvanizing a group of partners to ensure that low and middle income countries are represented in R&D response. For the next decade, we are honoring our commitment to address neglected diseases. We continue our effort on leishmaniasis, on filariasis, on Chagas diseases, on mycetoma, and potentially explore the possibility to deliver something on schistosomiasis. We will work as well to address the needs of people poorly served, for example, by proactively assessing the needs of children and seeking solutions for women and maternal health. We will also pursue the two other pillars of our strategy, which consist in strengthening existing research capacities in low and middle income countries and policy advocacy. It is a bold agenda, but one that 
with the enduring support and commitment from our partners and donors. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank many of them on this call, including, of course, the panelists. Together, I think that, uh, I believe that we can deliver this plan. Thank you. Um, a question, a follow-up question there, and you're right that people, you mentioned people, and that's exactly where the focus needs to be. Um, but you also mentioned this bold, ambitious plan, and you talked about that, and obviously partners are necessary. Um, can you talk about your partners as well, but also how does this all fit into the broader global health agenda for the next decade? What is key to the DNDI DNA uh, is a virtual model. Partnerships are key with a large number of partners, with a private sector industry, uh, large company, small company, biotech company, with a public health research and academia, with a non-governmental organization and, and civil society uh, organization. Today, uh, we have built a, a network of more than 200 partners, I could say that nothing will be possible without them. So I will highlight several features that we are really striving to put forward in the next decade. The next decade must be a decade of truly uh, empowering the best minds where, wherever they are, to deliver the best science for the most neglected. This was of our first motto, and we continue to, to support this objective. For DNDI, success means creating inclusive and sustainable partnership in low and middle income countries with scientists, with industry, with public leaders who must be at the center of the project. Mm. And we want more than just filling the gaps. We are concerned about sustainability. We aim to instigate change in the R&D ecosystem that fail with these patients. So it's why the advocacy pillar is also very important. Mm -hmm. I will conclude with saying COVID is a acute reminder today on yeah. how innovation and access ecosystem leave many people behind. So true, Bernard. And as though on cue, um, Dr. Ogutu, you can add a nuanced and rich perspective to the conversation here, as not only is Kemri no stranger to research excellence in its own right, but also that it was already in existence at a time when R&D, let alone partnerships, was minuscule in comparison. In your own words, what does it take to really advance more inclusive and sustainable R&D, as Bernard has just mentioned? Thank you very much, Patricia. And as Bernard puts it, I think uh, the last couple of years I've seen DNDI prove that the alternative way of R&D for neglected population and neglected diseases can work. Mm -hmm. Now is how do we move it to the next level yes. by impacting the ecosystem and creating equity and transparency in the partnership that were being developed. And the main thing that DNDI has proved is that you can actually evaluate and develop these drugs where the populations that are affected are in, which have some of very difficult environment in terms of research. Mm -hmm. And that has been proven to be done, that can be done. And now the main thing is that building this partnership the next level into R&D and bringing R&D to these low and middle income countries for sustainability of this partnership in drug research and drug development for neglected mm -hmm. populations. And I think this will come in, it's a disruptive way of looking at R&D to bring equity. And this will in, involve training and capacity building in those areas. These are started in a nascent way, but I think the next 10 years is to make sure that if this is ingrained, then you would have done the greatest thing, which is bringing innovation into low and middle income countries where the neglected populations are. Mm -hmm. So that you start looking at the disease from the concept to the patient or to the shelf where the drug needs to be in a straight line and making sure that what you develop 
actually meets the needs of that health system that we are dealing with. And I think that's when we say we are talking of a sustainable system because this also brings in that the governments, the organization within the low and middle income countries will have to participate and start putting money where they think it's useful for the society. Thank you. Couldn't agree with you more um, there, especially about uh, national governments being more involved. That's uh, crucial. Um, just how integrated, I mean, there's you know some very well-powered ongoing studies like Anticove that are going on as well that, um, that you could touch on. And just how well um, are these integrated into DNDI's new eight-year strategy, Ogutu? I think uh, the greatest thing that possibly has happened is that DNDI moves to fill the space and possibly, but filling the space where nobody's working in and the yeah. possibly the gap that was left. When COVID came in, the main thing is that there was a big drive in R&D, but none was happening in Africa. Mm -hmm. And as all of us got to know, the disease was the cotomas that the presentation was totally different in different parts of the world. And uh, DNDI was able to come up and say, what can we do because we work in this region, we have been developing products, why can't we get this done? And it yeah. didn't take long before a coalition was set up, the Anticom and Coalition of, for Clinical Development and Research around this. And we were able to raise funds, start evaluation of available products that has potential to treat COVID, to evaluate them within the communities where the disease is ravaging and causing a lot of havoc. And I think this showed the prowess and what the brand of DNDI has been in the last 15 years, that they could cobble and possibly bring that traction to bring people together within a couple of months and be able to raise funds. This, I mean, this is not a mean achievement at this particular time. Oh, de definitely. Um, very exciting work going on there. And of course, we'll all be keeping an eye on, on um, progression of that. Now, yes, you've talked about combining forces. I'm moving over to you, Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, it's important. Welcome also recently launched a bold new strategy to support science to solve the urgent health challenges facing everyone. What convergences do you see between Welcome's and DNDI's analysis of challenges and of course the opportunities for this coming decade? Thanks, Patricia, and um, it's a pleasure to join you all. Um, but also, I think, to pay tribute to what DNDI has also al already achieved in its uh, 15 or, or so years. Uh, DNDI, when it was set up, and I like Bernard's phrase there, set up in frustration. Um, <laughs> it, you've got to be frustrated uh, yeah. if you're going to change something. Uh, you've got to not accept the status quo and uh, DNDI have not accepted the status quo over the last 15 years and I hope the new strategy doesn't accept the status quo uh, today. Uh, DNDI was ahead of its time and it needs to be in the future and that does mean reinventing yourself sometimes but you shouldn't I think forget your history, where you've come from and why you were there and that frustration that Bernard talked about and I think that takes DNDI forward and that's very much aligned with with what Welcome has recently gone through. It's painful to go through a strategic review. Uh, it has to come with substantial internal reforms. You have to look at yourself, not just the outside world of the status quo. You have to look at yourself and if you have the systems internally, but then you have to be bold in what you're offering if you're gonna go through a new strategy. And I think what where we've landed at Welcome is we're absolutely committed to discovery science still, and we will continue to be so. But as we've grown bigger, we've wanted to actually focus our attention more on three areas which we think define the 21st century. And I think in essence also align very much with DNDI's work as well. And, and that is around infections, particularly those infections which are escalating and indeed neglected. Second mm -hmm. is the impact of climate change on health. This will be the defining issue of the 21st century. Uh, the impact on health is profound now and it will grow over the coming decades. And lastly, on mental health. Uh, because I think, again, mental health is something neglected. It predominantly affects, of course, young people, which has profound implications for education and their future jobs and their roles in society. And so these three things, which we think are going to define our time and which have a focus on youth and which have an inequitable impact on societies around the world is, is where we're going to focus our attention. And I think much of that 
is absolutely aligned with where DNDI is working uh, as well. Committed to open access, committed uh, to open transparent sharing of data and critically sharing the benefits of science, not just doing the science, but making sure that science is shared equitably with everybody in the world. So moving from, from what you feel is going to define the next um, 10 years or so, what do you see that's changing in the global health research environment that constitutes a challenge? And would be also good to hear what advice you'd give to DNDI to help them rise above you know, some of these challenges. I've, I've learned over the years to be careful giving advice to Bernard because um, he's, he's usually <laughs> yeah. well ahead of he's usually well ahead of me. Um, uh, I think there are some challenges coming. We have to acknowledge yeah. that um, science and technology has made uh, enormous progress in twelve months. Twelve months, ten months from a, a genome sequence to a vaccine is extraordinary. Uh, but we've seen vaccine nationalism and indeed vaccine apartheid now playing out, as we heard earlier from from Mary Paul. That brings the challenges to all of us. The world's economy is not going to look good after the COVID crisis eventually comes to an end, whenever that is. So governments are going to be under uh, financial and economic pressure. It even more behoves us to make the case for science, for research and development, and for equitable access to that. It, it's not a given that the way COVID has exposed the inequalities in all of our society, that governments will remember that when it comes to the economic downturn that will inevitably, I'm afraid, uh, follow on from COVID. And so we have to redouble our efforts. We have to make sure the science is good. We do not want to produce poor things and bad drugs and bad diagnostics. We want the best and we want to make sure the best is available to everybody. That needs to be our mantra. We mustn't forget the frustration of Bernard and many others of 15 years ago. And we use, must use that as the energy to go forward and recommit uh, in the new strategy of DNDI and indeed at Welcome to living those values and that uh, uh, commitment and, and ethos of the way we go forward. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for that. I see so many questions coming in on the Q&A, so keep those coming in. Um, we'll be able to have some time to take some of those questions. But uh, moving in uh, on uh, to you, Dr. Sumia, who, uh, WHO, I said who, WHO is the normative agency, you know, always setting the pace for roadmaps and research prevention and response, including for diseases of DNDI focus, for example, NTDs. Where do you see value in DNDI's approach to some of these challenges? So I think, um... You know, the DNDI relationship with WHO, I would say, is really an ideal one uh, in terms of a public-private partnership or a product development partnership, really working with, not, with WHO, which is a normative agency, and mm -hmm. being very complementary. So as an example, we develop the target product profiles for, uh, you know, diagnostics or drugs or vaccines. Uh, for diseases, we have been focusing mainly on infectious diseases, uh, but we want to expand that to the non-communicable diseases as well. But then yeah. what ENDI does is, is take those TPPs and really uh, focus on developing products that would meet those target product profiles. And I must say during the COVID pandemic as well, it I think was critical that WHO put out the target product profiles for vaccines for example, quite early on so that developers knew what they were aiming for and all the regulators around the world aligned with those benchmarks. And so we had this global harmonized view of, of what the product, what it should meet. Uh, and, and we've stuck with that. So similarly with, with the other products, I think it's been incredibly useful. Again, speaking about the pandemic, I think DNDI really uh, sort of stepped in and filled a place. Uh, the anti-COV uh, trial platform was mentioned. As you know, there are only a handful of uh, platforms, trial platforms across the world that have been really able to do large, you know, randomized, high-quality clinical trials that yeah. give definitive answers to the questions that people set out. And while a lot of the trials were focused on hospitalized patients, the anti-COV platform actually deals with a different population, which is the outpatient population, which of course is the majority of people with COVID and is trying to answer the question of how do you 
uh, treat people uh, to prevent them from getting ill and needing hospitalization. And so I think that was unique. And, and the other thing that was unique, of course, was that the platform was based in Africa. There were, I think 15 African countries that came together that developed the protocol together that you know went through the local regulatory and ethics reviews. So it's, uh, I think, a, a, a different paradigm and we need much more of that kind of leadership coming from affected countries because you know the, the cost benefit of interventions does vary depending on where you live. And so a treatment which costs $3,000 a day might make sense or even $10,000 a day might make sense in a very high income country where it costs much more to have people in hospital. And so the cost of this kind of a treatment, if it reduces the number of days of hospitalization, it makes sense in that context. It does not make sense in the context of where you, we do not have that kind of luxury of providing uh, these kind of expensive treatments. So I think the context is important and that's why researchers from countries that bear the burden of many of these infectious diseases, especially the neglected diseases, it's really critical that they are in the leadership role in setting the priorities and in undertaking the research. And that's what DNDI enables. It empowers local researchers, it supports and facilitates, but it enables a research to be done in a way in which the results can actually be, be taken up and become policy. And I know this from firsthand experience because coming from India, where a lot of the work on visceral leishmaniasis was done, DNDI's work um, on miltefacine, for example, was critical in that actually becoming an accepted treatment and becoming part of policy in India. So involving the right people, the policymakers, the local credible researchers and local communities, I think is, is a good example of, of DNDI's very impactful work. Okay, and, and in keeping with that, I won't ask you for advice. Um, Jeremy shied away from that and I'm not going to put you in the spot either. Um, so if we were to talk ideas, thoughts, um, from you to DNDI, what they should continue doing, what they should stop doing, and what they can certainly do better. What would you say? Well, there's, I can think of a lot of things that they should do. Uh, so the problem always is that everybody tells you to do more and more. So <laughs> and what yeah. do you stop doing? But I would say that if they had to prioritize and focus, focus on pediatric populations because they're often left out. And in mm -hmm. fact, we now have a new program, DNDI is a partner in this GAP F consortium that's really trying to develop pediatric drugs, pediatric formulations for many diseases, because even if you have the treatment for a disease, it's not available as a pediatric easy to use formulation. So I would say continue the focus on pediatrics, keep the focus on gender as well, because very often in research, we, there's an imbalance, you know, women are not included in clinical trials as much as men, pregnant women are not included, children are not included. So always keeping that, uh, that perspective uh, is, is important. And the third thing I would say is that it's important to do implementation research. Even if you have a product, how do you use it uh, in a particular context again? And this is where I think the social sciences is, is also very important. And so enabling implementation research, which usually is a combination of quantitative and qualitative research, you're bringing in the behavioral and social scientists, the perhaps health economists as well. That's what will drive uh, a product from becoming accepted and part of policy and practice. And you are so right. Making ourselves better was one of the things that has been mentioned um, in the discussion so far so that we can better ourselves for those that require our expertise, the vulnerable people and the communities. That's why we're all here and that's why we all strive for. Now, I'm a very happy moderator given that I have so much time for all these questions that are now um, going to be forwarded to the panelists. Um, but before we do that, let's take a moment for a few more voices from the future experts before we return for our Q&A session. My name is Finn. I am a non-binary activist from Malaysia. My vision for global health for the next 10 years is safe, accessible and holistic healthcare for transgender and non-binary people. I hope one day to be able to access the health services I need without fear, without having to explain, 
defend and justify why I am who I am. Meu nome é Isaac Serafim, eu sou estudante de medicina e ativista do movimento por acesso a medicamentos e saúde pública, ativista também pela UAM. Bom, e eu acredito que nos próximos 10 anos acontecerá uma revolução na saúde global, principalmente pelo que nós estamos passando agora com essa pandemia, porque estamos vendo a importância da saúde ser tratada não como uma mercadoria, e sim como um direito. E acredito que os debates e todas as informações que estão sendo levantadas agora vão servir ainda mais para a nossa luta por uma saúde mais igualitária, uma saúde mais equânime e gratuita e que todos tenham acesso. My name is Piriti Wamboi and I am a recent pharmacy graduate and a global health enthusiast from Kenya. My vision for the next 10 years of global health is that gender inequalities will not continue to define and drive career pathways. With women accounting for more than 75% of the healthcare workforce in most countries, I look forward to seeing more women taking up more leadership positions in global health institutions over the next 10 years. Bonjour DNDI, je m'appelle Andrea Mavanga, enfant reporter de la RDC, j'ai 14 ans et ce que je voudrais c'est d'abord vous remercier pour ce que vous faites sur la recherche des médicaments sur les maladies tropicales négligées mais aussi vous encourager à encore faire mieux pour parvenir à éradiquer un maximum de ces maladies. Aux partenaires de continuer à soutenir DNDI dans le développement des médicaments sur les maladies tropicales négligées pour mieux lutter contre ces maladies. Ces maladies ne sont peut-être pas connues, mais elles affectent nos vies et nos familles. Notre avenir est entre vos mains. Nous comptons sur vous. What great support and encouragement there. Um, but I think purity is a woman after Sumia's heart. Um, okay, straight to the Q&A at this point. Um, I have a question for Jeremy. Um, the youth advocates that we've just heard from today show us why diversity and representation are so critical to global health. How can science funders like Welcome help spur action to ensure women, people of color um, and people, sorry, excuse me, and people from developing countries are more equally represented in leadership positions at the institutions that you support? So uh, it's, I think the most important issue to start it with is for organizations, all of our organizations, and I absolutely include welcome in this, to acknowledge the issues as they are. Yeah. It, unless you do that, and it, you know, as people will appreciate, it is sometimes uh, uncomfortable for various organizations. But until you do that and you acknowledge uh, the problems that do exist in terms of inclusion, in terms of the research environment, in terms of the career structure, including the disincentives and including uh, a, a diverse approach, both to ideas and opportunities. Until you acknowledge you have a problem, you can't solve it. And then when you try to solve it, you need to include all of those voices in advising how you go about doing that. And that is something that at Welcome has been absolutely, I would say perhaps the biggest issue that's been integral at the center of the new strategy. And actually in the chat bar or in the q and I've I've put a link to um, something just we posted in the last few, few days actually about uh, diversity, changing the research environment, changing the career opportunities for people and shifting the center of gravity to where the questions asked and where the uh, uh, processes are, are driven. Two examples from Welcome, the Deltas program uh, now run with a complete shift of center of gravity to in fact Nairobi as the center and to the India Alliance with the Indian DBT uh, group and I think that shift in the center of gravity has been absolutely critical. Yes, yes. Um, I do remember the, the Deltas program very fondly, given that I did some work with them as well. Um, thank you for that um, response. Um, Dr. Ogutu, we hear a lot about the potential for South-South cooperation in tackling gaps in innovation and access. What specific things can governments do better or do more of to boost collaboration between researchers and industry players across LMICs? Ogutu? Oh, we lost him. Thank you very much, and there's a... Go ahead, go ahead. We can hear you. 
Yeah, I Thank think you. the main thing is that uh, one thing that people need to accept is that in, in research and innovation, no country will be self-sufficient and you need other people from other countries to work on this one thing that the scientists themselves how to sell to the governments in the low and middle income countries and this advocacy needs to happen that you you they, they have to see themselves funding across the board one country that has started doing that trying to have uh, research and innovation agreements with other countries in africa is south africa and I think this was to expand the richer space beyond South Africa. And I think this is one, of, one thing that the, the, the countries in Africa need to understand. And we must know that nobody is going to have all the technologies in country. And we need to start supporting researchers to work across different countries and even across different regions. And this will spur that unique competitiveness and also we'll find that people synergize much more and work across the continent. And I think this, this now coming clearly around the African CDC, this is now starting to take shape and build on some of the platforms and co co collaboration that have been set up. And the, the grants like the Deltas are playing into this and possibly starting to create several centers of excellence and networks across Africa. And I think this is key so that we, have much more brain recirculation and people moving across to different countries in Africa and creating this seamless, borderless use of knowledge and collaboration across the region. And, and, I, must, and I must say, from somebody on the outside almost looking in, advocacy, I mean, the anti code I hadn't heard of that until I started working, doing this work with DNDI. And I was like, what? You mean this is actually going on? We need much more noise made about um, these initiatives that are taking place. Thank you so much, uh, Ogutu. Let's uh, move on to the next question um, to Bernard. How has DNDI's partnership model evolved over the lifetime of the organization? How do you see it further evolving in the next decade? <clears throat> Thanks, Patricia. That's a long one for you there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think uh, when we started, uh, we started from scratch. In fact, we have just uh, have in mind that we started with only four people and, and a, a network that was uh, put in place. And immediately we set up uh, offices and, 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 and solid platform uh, in different regions. So it, it was what is the beginning of, of the NDI. And, and uh, Initially, people were thinking that the only way will be to have a, a strong partnership with large ph pharmaceutical in industry. And, and we have, in fact, succeeded in, in developing some of these partnerships and, and some of the products that we are currently developing are coming from this partnership. But uh, during the course of, uh, of, of, of the development of the NDI, we have also tested uh, other partnerships uh, and I could illustrate with the example of hepatitis C, where we have developed a new chemical entity with a, a partnership between a small biotech in, uh, in California, working with, with partners in Egypt, in Malaysia, and in, in Argentina. And this, according to me, is probably the, the next phase of, of the development. So we could imagine to replicate this model. I'm not excluding one versus the other, but I think uh, having a uh, this collaboration uh, between country, between continent, with the uh, different skills uh, uh, present and, and with the perspective of uh, developing innovation uh, from the South to the South, I think this will represent clearly an evolution of, uh, of our partnership. Thank you, thank you very much. This next question is actually for you as well. What is the advantage of investing in the earliest research to develop new chemical entities as opposed to repurposing existing drugs for the diseases DNDI works on? Yeah, I would say that uh, making a choice will be a, a huge mistake. Uh, I think it depends a lot from disease to disease. It uh, depends a lot of the situation when you start a, a program. So it's why uh, uh, we have always mentioned that uh, our strategy should combine short to mid-term project when uh, with existing drugs, improving new formulation, we can respond to the need of a population. This is still relevant in some 
some some disease, some some particular problem to be the solution. But in many other situations, uh, to respond to the, the famous uh, target product profile that uh, Sumia mentioned before, so to have the, the treatment uh, adapted to the condition uh, in the field to, to really change the dynamic of management of diseases, you need innovation, you need new product, much more modern, uh, simple drug. Uh, uh, and this, of course, require investment on, on discovery at early stage. So impossible to make a choice. We have to maintain the two and, and be pragmatic in, in, a, in a choice and, and have systematically keep in mind systematically that uh, the patient needs are driving your, your portfolio, are driving your, your, your strategy, not the opposite. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, question for you, Jeremy. Jeremy, how can DNDI welcome and the research community react and advocate to persuade governments to maintain funding for research in infectious diseases affecting low income countries. We have seen recently cuts to this funding in the UK that is affecting drug discovery projects. Yeah, Patricia, I don't think we're loud enough as you said earlier. Um, <laughs> and, and I think we've got to see the strength of our collective voices. Some, sometimes I, I feel that the fragmented approach uh, of this community sometimes means that, frankly, governments can almost divide and rule. I, I, I think yeah. you know, we are aligned, DNDI, MSF, Welcome, uh, many, many others, Kemri, uh, we, we, you know, we're all arguing from a similar point, and yet sometimes I think we're not as, um, we come across as a little bit fragmented, uh, and, and as a result can perhaps be divided uh, up. So I, I think advocacy, Focusing on the real impact that you can have, uh, that, that Bernard has talked about, uh, the difference it makes to people's lives when the world is very, very, very small and very vulnerable and we are all affected. Uh, I think COVID will show that, will bring that out. And that, I hate to say it, but it's something that we must grasp and push forward further and, and not be frightened of, uh, of being bold uh, or when yeah. necessary, aggressive in the, in the comments that we make. Yeah. And, and engaging the media. I mean, there's a question here. Um, if I'm just to quickly look, do you um, does DNDI train journalists on covering what you do? Um, is there a program for media partnerships? And I think this is certainly something um, that needs to be talked more about. A question for you, uh, Sumia, with the enormous costs of the COVID pandemic to the world, on the world, and the costs to combat climate change. How can we ascertain that budgets for aid and drugs for tropical diseases are not cut or reduced? Not sure I have an answer to that. It's a very good question. And I yeah. think previous speakers have also mentioned that uh, the world is going to be in a difficult position in terms of how much aid there is going to be. And we need to ensure that, uh, that research into these neglected diseases and high priority diseases doesn't go down. At the same time, I think we have to explore models that um, are different, that are cost effective, that are uh, that build upon the strengths and some of the learnings of collaborative science that we've seen during the past year. <clears throat> what I found was that, you know, the world's scientists were very willing to come together and share of their knowledge openly and freely because of this vision and, and the, the collective mission to solve the problem of COVID and develop new tools. So it is possible to do. We do need to look at, um, at models of, of um, sharing this knowledge more widely. I mean, it happened in the pandemic. It doesn't necessarily happen always. And so when there is a new technology which can make a big impact, especially when it's related to health and disease, should that be considered you know, as a global public good mm -hmm. and made available to people who need it regardless of their ability to pay? Now there has to be a model which is able to, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to say, but it's difficult to implement if the people yeah. who are discovering this new technology or, or the innovators are not able to scale it and provide it at that scale. But I think there's a lot of thinking going into this kind of new model 
uh, of R&D where you really have to define something as a global public good and then it becomes a responsibility of citizens of the world at large to find a, a solution. And I think we're going to be faced with this in, uh, in the coming years quite quickly where new technologies are gonna be used to cure diseases in high income countries. And we might, if we are not prepared, find ourselves in a situation where the same diseases cannot be uh, tackled in lower income countries. And so I think we have to collectively think about this problem and, I, and I'm sure that we can think of solutions. Everyone needs to be willing to give something. And, and I think people at large, um, you know, there've been many terms used about this um, shareholder capitalism and things like that, where citizens and shareholders of large companies um, make the point that it should not be driven only by profits, but really the benefits in terms of saving lives and improving health of people should be equally, if not more valuable. But there, this is going to be a change that will take some time to occur. But I think we've seen it to some extent happen in COVID. It hasn't been perfect at all, but I think it's opened some doors here that, that yeah. we should uh, continue to explore. Yeah. Yes, all right. Yes, all right. Um, Bernard, let's let's have you back here. What is DNDI's approach to making sure patients have access to the treatments it works on? Okay, I go. I, I could jump first on on a comment of of Sumia because, of course, first uh, we need to develop a new uh, new treatment or new product as common public good. So, so this this really is a. Uh, it's a first con condition that uh, we need to keep in mind all, all of the process, but it's, it's not enough uh, to, to, to reach the last mile. So it's why that uh, uh, implementation program are very important uh, uh, to, to complement the effort of R&D. So in fact, we have to systematically talk about innovation and access. Innovation alone, uh, uh, if we don't have a, a plan for access, it's not sufficient. So it's why the, the, the contribution and the collaboration with, uh, with the national programs, uh, so with the with public leadership in the country, with, with the communities is extremely important, uh, even during the phase of, of development of, of the product, because it's the best way to prepare the accessibility uh, uh, to, the, to the benefit of this research at the end. So I think it's a continuum. So you have to, have access in mind permanently. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, no, necess no need to, to invest uh, in innovation if you cannot secure access at the end. Mm -hmm. Very true, very true. Uh, now, I would just like to say, in terms of uh, um, questions, there are so many on there still that require um, some sort of answer from the panelists. In fact, you have to just ask all the panelists to turn their cameras on uh, at this stage, um, if you can, to be able to just go directly in there um, with a response, if you, if you have one, so that uh, at least everyone feels that um, their question or their comment has been addressed um, at this stage. Um, I think with all the cameras on, <laughs> Um, Alessandra, you'd wanted to take a little snapshot just to make sure that we've got this all covered. Um, but also, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all the participants, all the, all the questions from the audience, because there were so many. I think we ended up so swamped, and yet we're running out of time at this stage. Um, of course, I'd like to say thank you to our esteemed speakers for their time and valuable insights as well. Um, just as much as we encourage you to continue sharing your ideas on global health futures, I'd also like us all to reflect on what more can be done to keep a people-centered approach central to healthcare, because that is why we're all here. Uh, if there's any last minute messages, Dr. Bernard Pekul, Dr. Sumia, Swaminathan, Dr. Jeremy Farah, Dr. Bernardo Gutu, Dr. Marie Paul Kien, if there's any last minute comment you would like to be able to just put out there in the last couple of minutes, you're welcome to do so now. 
None we've from talked you? A lot of, we've talked a lot about international agencies um, and they must be committed. But domestic mm. funding of science and research development is absolutely crucial as well. And, and that has to be there for that shift in the center of gravity. Good final point there, yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. I think uh, uh, we'll be successful. Uh, yeah. Bernard or yeah. the, the two, Bernard. the two Bernard. Bernard, go to first. Sorry, to go thank ahead. you. I think for from my end, I think the main thing is that uh, the air has started a new way of alternative way for. R&D, and I think this, it just begs that the scientists within the low and middle income countries like in Africa need to step up by lobbying government to start investing in health. And we need to be part of the early development of products. And I think that's when we'll have a sustainable system for R&D for the neglected populations that we have in our region, which because of climate change and other global changes, we are going to have a bigger population of neglected populations. And we need to get ready for that. I would just like to say that there's a lot of innovation that's happening in these countries, you know, whether it's in Africa or Asia, young people are finding solutions for their own problems. And these are usually quite incredibly cost uh, effective and affordable and, uh, and very innovative. So there needs to be, um, as uh, Bernardo Gutu was saying, uh, governments need to have find a mechanism of really supporting innovators, local innovation, and and a, and a way for them to actually move those ahead. Because what you really is missing today is, I think, a mechanism to scale up promising innovations. And while this could happen to some extent at the global level. I think focusing at the regional and national levels would probably be in the short term uh, a more impactful strategy. Bernard or Marie Paul, any final thoughts from you both? Bernard, go ahead. Okay. Um... I think uh, I would like to insist, uh, like the others, that, uh, of the importance to be strongly connected with uh, with government and to have commitment. And I, I, would, I would say uh, the voice coming from the young people in this uh, uh, in this debate was was quite important. There is there is a strong mo motivation coming from uh, from this generation, and 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 they need to take over. Uh, they need to be the one that uh, uh, support this change. Uh, because we are expecting a change yes. uh, uh, to have a more equitable uh, system at the end, a more uh, balanced way of delivering innovation and access. So it's uh, my message. But of course, I want to thank, I want to take advantage, uh, opportunity to thank all participants and particularly the panelists. But I know that among the participants, we have a lot of uh, our uh, key contributors to the activities that... Uh, we have to implement in the next decade. So thank you. But Marie Paul. Thanks a lot. Indeed, uh, as you all said, you know, we, we need to have a change of system, a change of, uh, of, uh, of vision on, on how we can move away from the inequity that we know. And we are all part of this change. Of course, the development partners and the high income countries, uh, finances have to help, but this is a responsibility for all of us. It is a responsibility for government in low income country. It is a responsibility of the youth to make sure that their world is better than ours. So let us all help them uh, to, uh, to change the, uh, the status quo and, and to, to change the world we are living in. Thank you very much. Great message to end there on. Um, we're exactly on time. Thank you so much again, once again. Please do stay safe and do mask up and have a wonderful rest of day. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.